Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is September 30, 1982, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 79. Throughout the Middle Ages, the Christians of Central Europe shared a terrible fear which is all but forgotten today. It was a fear which caused Christian parents to exercise special care over their children at the time of the Jewish Holy Day of Passover. Their greatest dread was that their child might be kidnapped and never seen again, because it was widely believed that the Jews practiced human sacrifice at Passover and that the victims were Christian children. That ancient blood fear of the Jews by Christians largely died out in the centuries following the Renaissance. Today most Christians are shocked to learn that any such belief ever existed. As for the Jews themselves, there is a rabbinical term that is used to condemn the ancient Christian blood fear. It is called blood libel. For generations now the old issue of blood libel has been essentially a dead one, a thing of the past. No Jew in his right mind would want it otherwise. To revive the issue of blood libel is to resurrect ancient fears, unreasoning passions, and mortal danger to every Jew alive. Yes, most Jews would be better off if they never again heard about the ancient Christian blood fear of the Jews. But this month none other than the Government of Israel has deliberately revived the so-called blood libel issue. Over the weekend of September 17, Israeli forces introduced so-called Christian militiamen into two Palestinian refugee camps in West Beirut. The result was a massacre of over a thousand Palestinian civilians, including many women, children, and elderly people. Word of the massacre reached the outside world on the evening of Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, September 18. An outraged world blamed the Begin government for allowing such a heinous crime to take place. The Israeli government's official reply to the world was a statement issued on Sunday, September 19. It was published two days later as a full-page advertisement in major American newspapers with the headline, Blood Libel. The statement began with the words, and I quote, On the New Year, Rosh Hashanah, a blood libel was leveled against the Jewish state, its government, and the Israeli Defense Forces, otherwise known as the IDF. The statement then continued with a series of statements which only days later were proven to be total lies. The official Israeli government statement said the massacre took place, quote, in an area where there was no position of the Israeli army, unquote. Yet the very next day after this statement was published, the Israeli Defense Minister Sharon flatly contradicted it. On September 22, Sharon admitted that the Israelis not only introduced the militiamen into the camps, but also supported them with airborne flares. The official Israeli government advertisement also said, quote, As soon as the IDF learned of the tragic events, Israeli soldiers put an end to the slaughter, unquote. That too was a lie, and numerous reports have already surfaced to show that it was a lie. The fact is that the Israeli troops had orders to surround and cut off the two Palestinian camps while the militiamen did the dirty work. From start to finish, top Israeli officials knew exactly what was going on. They had ordered the entire operation and were kept informed of its progress. By calling the accusations against their blood libel, the Begin government acknowledged that the Beirut massacre was a subhuman act of bloodthirsty evil. But the transparent lies about it by the Begin government reflect the fact that the charges against it are not libel. They are the truth. My friends, it's no accident that the Beirut massacre was centered around Friday, September 17. In AUDIO LETTER No. 78 last month, I reported that September 17 was scheduled to be a day of nuclear massacre. That was the day when the super-secret Project Z nuclear war plan was to be set off. If all had gone according to plan, a surprise American nuclear first strike against Russia was scheduled for that day. But by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, all did not go according to plan. The Project Z nuclear strike plan was finally aborted, for now that is, 
around mid-morning September 17. The countdown clock stopped less than five hours short of Nuclear War I. The final decision to abort the strike ended a week of fierce debate at the top levels of the Reagan-Bagan axes of Bolsheviks and Zionists. Meanwhile, another war plan has already been set in motion to replace it. The Beirut massacre, which was underway on September 17, is a key ingredient in the new military intrigues now underway. But the massacre was also motivated by sheer insane frenzy. It was the blind frenzy of satanic and demonic forces who saw their goal of nuclear victory slip away just when it seemed within their grasp. My three special topics for this AUDIO LETTER are Topic No. 1, the aborted plan for surprise nuclear war. Topic No. 2, the Beirut massacre for war to come. And Topic No. 3, the return of the Siberia Express weather war. Topic No. 1, when I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 78 late last month, I made public the final Pentagon plans for Nuclear War I to erupt this month. September 1982. The Pentagon war planners were counting down toward Friday, September 17, to set off nuclear war as a complete surprise. But as the final days ticked away this month, major snags began to develop in the Rush Rush War timetable. Finally the decision was made to scrub the planned nuclear first strike against Russia virtually at the last minute. As I reported last month, the first H-bombs were to be detonated on key Russian targets at 3 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on September 17. The order to scrub the attack went out less than five hours before that, shortly after 10 a.m. that morning. When a decision finally came to abort the attack, it was a judgment call, and that judgment was far from popular with some members of the elite Bolshevik war planning team in the Pentagon. The snags which developed this month were very serious, but not serious enough to completely rule out an attempted nuclear strike. As a result, the war planning group became splintered into acrimonious debate over what to do. No one argued in favor of giving up the basic goal of attacking Russia, but there was a sharp division over how best to save the nuclear war plan. Basically the argument boiled down to two alternatives, whether to postpone the nuclear strike or whether to go ahead as planned. The hotheads insisted that the surprise nuclear attack against Russia should proceed on schedule on September 17. They argued that in spite of the problems which had cropped up, delay would only give time for even more obstacles to develop. They also pointed out that their intelligence on Russian targets will gradually grow stale with delay. In effect, they said, now is our best chance. The more conservative faction among the war planners insisted that the hotheads were not thinking straight. In their view, the hitches which developed this month in the war plan were too serious to go ahead now. Better to wait and reschedule the Project Z war plan after removing the present obstacles to success. The debate began to tip in favor of a postponement one week before the September 17 target date. For that reason, other contingency plans were set in motion in the Middle East during that final week, but the nuclear strike plan remained in effect right down to the wire. In the end, it was an accumulation of many factors which finally caused the plan to be aborted. The Bolsheviks here started running into trouble in their Rush Rush nuclear war plan almost as soon as it started early this year of 1982. I first reported that a shortcut nuclear war strategy was being implemented by the Pentagon seven months ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 72. At the same time, I also reported that the Rockefeller cartel and the Russians were lining up to try to stop the war plan. To that end, they had agreed to start working together against the American Bolsheviks in certain ways. On top of that, a coup d'etat was brewing here in Washington to be led by General Alexander Haig, then Secretary of State. In the seven months since I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 72, world headlines repeatedly have been filled with the consequences of this three-way struggle. First came the Falklands War last April, which was not about sheep and settlers but about secret weapons installations. The secret Pentagon war plan received a severe blow in that skirmish, but the Bolsheviks here soon struck back. 
In June they destroyed the Hague coup d'etat. At the same time the brutal Israeli invasion of Lebanon was underway, right on the timetable which I had made public last year, and which Sharon, Defense Minister of Israel, confirmed only this week in the Knesset. And then there was the fourth space shuttle which carried the Defense Department payload into orbit to prepare for war. By midsummer, leaders of both America and Russia were making statements that the superpowers were already at war. The Russians started firing warning shots across America's bow by way of weather modification, airplane disasters, and more. Finally last month on August 12, the Russians used sheer intimidation to thwart the Israeli plan for an incredibly bloody invasion of Beirut. Suddenly the PLO evacuation talks bore fruit and the evacuation went off without a hitch. It was a serious blow to the joint Bolshevik Zionist efforts to create an atmosphere of mushrooming crisis as a prelude to nuclear war. For about two weeks the atmosphere of world crisis appeared to almost evaporate, but the Pentagon war clock was still counting down towards September 17, and the Russians knew it. On September 2 the Soviet Union abruptly disconnected all direct dial telephone service to and from the West. Instead, military operators took over. It was an extension of the telephone cutbacks which had begun months earlier. To the top Pentagon war strategists, the Russian telephone service cutback of September 2 seemed like small potatoes. They had bigger things to worry about, namely a serious turn of events in Red China. The previous day, September 1, Communist Party Chairman Hu Yaobang had dropped a bombshell at the Party Congress in Peking. He declared that China should no longer ally itself with the United States against Russia. Instead, Hu said China should regard both superpowers as equal threats, but at the same time he included some conciliatory language toward Russia. And my friends, high Russian officials will go to China to begin talks in two weeks' time at China's invitation. By disowning the Sino-American alliance, Hu Yaobang made it clear that the secret American stealth attack base in China was in jeopardy. That base, located in Red China's western Xinjiang Province, is essential for the intended attack on Russia's two Cosmosphere bases in Siberia. Last month I reported that this war base was the reason for the joint communique of August 17 by the United States and Red China concerning Taiwan. The communique commits the United States to discontinue arms delivery to Taiwan at some future date in violation of Reagan's past pledges. The communique was agreed to in order to head off a threatened shutdown of the stealth base by the Chinese, but it was not enough to satisfy the Chinese. On September 6, former President Richard Nixon arrived in Peking, adding further to the troubles of the Pentagon war planners. Nixon has long been a client follower of the Rockefeller cartel, as I detailed in my book The Conspiracy Against the Dollar nearly ten years ago. Nixon went to Peking this month as a Rockefeller envoy, and one with far more credibility for the Chinese than anyone the Bolsheviks have. Nixon shocked the Chinese by confirming what Russian sources had already told them, that the stealth base was about to be used in war. Nixon then counseled them not to shut down the base outright at this time for fear of undesirable reactions by the trigger-happy Pentagon Bolsheviks. Instead he urged the Chinese to start interfering with operation of the stealth base by bureaucratic devices. That is one thing the Chinese are very good at, and they accepted Nixon's advice. By September 9 the American stealth base in Xinjiang Province, China was effectively out of action. Critical base personnel were tangled up in Chinese red tape, preventing them from reporting for duty. The Chinese are giving hints to Washington that all this is due to continued dissatisfaction over Taiwan. But the real reason, my friends, is that they want no part of nuclear war with Russia. The Kremlin received word through Rockefeller channels on September 9 that the Xinjiang Province stealth base had been effectively neutralized. At that point the Russians could rest assured that even if the Pentagon went through with its nuclear attack plan, Russia's cosmospheres would survive. Russia's critical space triad of strategic weapons could no longer be destroyed. 
The time had come to carry out the most dangerous step in the Kremlin plan to unravel the Pentagon nuclear war plan. The time had come to destroy the attack confirmation sensor placed in space by the Space Shuttle last June. The attack confirmation sensor was a special satellite placed in geostationary orbit over the Indian Ocean by an auxiliary rocket. As I have reported before, it was a cryogenic satellite, that is, it was maintained at super-cold temperatures close to absolute zero. I can now reveal that this was intended to protect the satellite from detection by Russian space weapons. For several years now, American scientific intelligence analysts have known that the Russians have a new technology for target acquisition. The new Russian technique is not radar, nor is it any other conventional means of detecting and tracking targets. The new Russian technique is deadly accurate, reliable, and unlike radar, impossible to jam. Analysts here some time ago convinced themselves that they had figured out what the new Russian technique is. They believe it is a Russian version of computer-enhanced infrared detection. This has now been developed here in the United States and is called CEIR. C -E -I, -R. I first reported on this development in AUDIO LETTER No. 72 shortly after a CEIR-equipped American laser was used to shoot down a Russian Cosmosphere. American analysts are convinced that the Russians are using CEIR and that they had it first. And so when the Air Force attack confirmation sensor was designed, it was given a feature intended to defeat Russian infrared detectors. All objects warmer than absolute zero emit infrared radiation. The warmer the object is, the more infrared it emits, and the easier it is for computer-enhanced infrared sensors to detect it. The only way to hide from SEER is therefore to reduce the temperature as low as possible. That's why the Air Force attack confirmation sensor was a cryogenic satellite. A huge cooling system using liquid helium kept the satellite only a few degrees above absolute zero, reducing infrared emissions to nearly nothing. The cryogenic design of the Air Force satellite is what gave the Bolshevik war planners here so much confidence that it would succeed. They were sure that the Russians would be unable to find it in time to destroy it before it was used in war. But, my friends, the Bolsheviks in the Pentagon are wrong about the new Russian target tracking technique. It is not an infrared technique at all. Instead, it's a revolutionary system which detects the atomic vibrations of matter. The Russians call it Psychoenergetic Range Finding, or PRF. When I first reported on Russia's new PRF technique in AUDIO LETTER No. 42, I reported that the Russians regard it as their master secret weapon. The longer it remains a mystery to the American Bolsheviks, the better it will be for Russia. And so when Space Shuttle 4 launched the Air Force cryogenic sensor last June, the Russians started playing a game. Instead of destroying the satellite right away, they allowed it to be orbited successfully. The Russians knew that the attack confirmation satellite could do them no harm until war itself was about to begin, so they allowed it to stay there untouched for as long as possible. The result was exactly as expected. The long-term survival of the Air Force sensor has convinced the Bolsheviks here that they were right about Russia using SEER. The Pentagon has walked into a major intelligence blunder and the Russians are encouraging them to keep it up. Throughout the summer, Rockefeller cartel operatives within the CIA fed updates about the Pentagon war plan to the Russians. Those reports continued to say that the war timetable was remaining unchanged, targeted for mid-September, so the Russian Space Command left the Air Force sensor alone for the time being. Meanwhile, the Russians began preparing in a totally unsuspected way for the moment when they would destroy the satellite. Those preparations had to do with Russia's international telephone service. First in June, the Soviet Union drastically reduced the number of telephone links to the West. They also made clouded threats to reduce service still further at a later date. In order to keep the intelligence analysts here from guessing what was afoot, the Russians resorted to a little disinformation in the right places. 
They created falsified leaks that there were unsettled conditions in the Kremlin, a power struggle. The Bolsheviks here, who are always struggling for power, swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. The next major step was the one I mentioned earlier on September 2. That was the day when Russia suddenly cut off all automatic dialing service to and from the West. The Bolsheviks here were startled but still did not suspect what it really meant. They were too preoccupied with rumblings of trouble in China to worry for long about Russia's telephones. For the final step, the Kremlin waited, hoping that the maneuvers to disrupt the stealth base in Xinjiang Province would succeed. On September 9 they received a mission accomplished signal from the Rockefeller cartel. The Sinkian base was temporarily incapacitated thanks to Nixon's recommended bureaucratic entanglement by the Chinese. The next morning, Friday, September 10, there was a sudden total shutdown of most international telephone service to and from Russia. But in order to send a message to America's Bolshevik war planners, a few selected circuits were kept open. Those included Leningrad, Kiev, Minsk, and Tallinn. Their significance lay in the fact that none were targets planned for the initial stealth attack which I detailed last month. The phone lines were cut off at 7.10 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time or 2.10 p.m. Moscow Time. Moments later the Russian Space Command went to work. A Russian jumbo Cosmosphere was parked in a pseudo-orbit about two miles above the Air Force Attack Confirmation Satellite. It had been there for over two months from the moment the satellite was launched into orbit from Space Shuttle 4. By using its electromagnetic propulsion system at low power, the Cosmosphere had remained on station instead of slowly drifting away as a normal satellite would, and parked as it was above the downward-looking Air Force satellite, the presence of the Cosmosphere was never detected. Now the time had come. The Cosmosphere aimed its beam weapon and fired. Shortly after 7.10 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, Friday, September 10, there was bad news for the Bolsheviks here. At the newly operational Air Force Space Command in Colorado Springs, there was a sudden loss of signal from their Indian Ocean satellite. At first they could not believe that their critical attack confirmation satellite had been attacked. All sorts of things were tried in an effort to re-establish contact with the satellite, all to no avail. The satellite no longer existed. As that Friday morning of September 10 wore on, the Project Z war planners were convened in crisis conference. The question at hand was, what do we do now? For a while there was an atmosphere of near panic. Some were sure that a first strike by Russia was sure to follow and that the Pentagon should push the nuclear button without delay. Others argued that if that were the Kremlin's intention it was already too late. Russia's missiles would be on the way. At the opposite extreme, someone suggested that the whole Project Z war plan be aborted for now and rescheduled later on. Everyone agreed on one thing. Without the attack confirmation sensor, any attack on Russia had become far more risky. After launching the stealth planes from Norway and Turkey, it would just have to be assumed that they had destroyed their targets. With the attack confirmation satellite gone, there would be no way to confirm that, so the all-out follow-up attack by America's nuclear forces might run into a lot more trouble than expected. At that point someone remarked to the effect, we can still go with a backup plan. Every target in Russia that is attacked by our birds will be obliterated. If international telephone service to Russian target areas is suddenly cut off at zero hour, we can assume that our birds made it. There is an old military saying that goes, there is always someone who didn't get the word. The planner who suggested falling back on the backup plan based on telephones proved once again how true that saying is. Nearly everyone shouted at him, the phones to Russia are already shut down. My friends. The Russians kept the international phone line shut down for seven hours that day. They wanted to make sure that if the Pentagon Bolsheviks pushed the panic button, they would obtain no intelligence at all by monitoring telephone circuits. After the first two hours or so of the blackout, Secretary of State George Shultz was accosted by reporters about it. Shultz told them, it is very significant, quote, unquote, 
but would say no more. By the time Washingtonians were finishing their lunch that day, a decision had been reached about what to do. Project Z would continue on the original schedule targeted for the following Friday, September 17. Meanwhile, every effort would be made to cut through the Chinese red tape that was restricting use of the critical base in Xinjiang Province. At the same time, it was decided to set other plans in motion too, just in case Project Z should finally fall through. That is how it stood through the week leading up to Z Day, September 17. The Project Z first strike plan was in deep trouble, yet it was still on track. It had been decided that if nothing else went wrong, the surprise attack on Russia would still be launched on the 17th, come what may. The stroll that broke the camel's back came at almost the last possible minute on Friday morning, September 17. At about 8.30 a.m. here in Washington, a well-known national newspaper reporter was interviewed on the Washington NBC radio station WRC. The reporter of the Washington Post called attention to my war warning for that day contained in AUDIO LETTER No. 78. He reportedly outlined the plan briefly for everyone listening in the Washington metropolitan area, and he added that if the Pentagon did have such a plan, public exposure through my tape had probably reduced the chances that it would be carried out. My friends, that radio report here in Washington about the war plan on the morning of September 17 was seemingly a small thing. But our Lord Jesus Christ can always use little things to produce big results, and that is what He did on that morning of Z-Day. Thanks to those of you who had written to editors, congressmen, and officials of all kinds about the war plan, the Pentagon was becoming edgy. The last thing they wanted was public exposure of their war plan. When they heard the report that morning over radio station WRC, they quite simply panicked. They had no way of knowing just how widely their plan had become known. And so shortly after 10 a.m. Washington time, Friday, September 17, 1982, the Project Z first strike was called off. With less than five hours to go, the countdown clock for Nuclear War I had finally stopped ticking. Topic No. 2 Nearly 2,000 years ago our Lord Jesus Christ described some people as the sons of Satan who are liars from the beginning. Their inability to tell the truth is the hallmark of this special category of people who were condemned by our Lord. They never admit their own guilt about anything, but instead always justify themselves, saying they are blameless. But our Lord Jesus Christ declared that it is their kind who have shed the blood of innocent people from the beginning of time. In my opening remarks for AUDIO LETTER No. 78 last month, I mentioned a tragic photograph which appeared in American newspapers on August 1. It showed a nurse in a Beirut hospital feeding a tiny seven-week-old Lebanese baby who had been horribly maimed by the Israeli bombardment. The baby was swathed in bandages from the waist upward including the entire head except for a small area around the mouth. The baby had lost both arms at the shoulder. There were several different versions of the photo carried by various newspapers and wire services, and in some views the absence of the arms was unmistakable. As I reported last month, the government of Israel was enraged over the photo. They insisted that they were blameless for the baby's injuries and demanded a retraction. As I reported last month, wire services here refused to make a retraction. For the moment it appeared that a tiny ray of truth had won out for a change. But my friends, the sons of Satan who controlled the Israeli government could not let the matter rest. They resorted to their old favorite trick, which they refer to as creating new facts. On September 1, United Press International finally caved in to a solid month of Israeli pressure. On that day UPI published a pair of pictures. On the left was the original UPI version of the hospital photo of the mangled baby, and on the right was a new picture of a bouncing, robust baby without a scratch, held up to the camera by a cheerfully smiling nurse. Referring to the original photo and report, the UPI caption reads in part, and I quote, 
Israeli authorities challenged that report and released a photo at Wright, made August 22, saying it shows the same child after treatment. The infant had not lost both arms but only suffered slight injury to the wrist. The Israelis contended." Unquote. The caption concludes with the words, UPI regrets the error. My friends, anyone who saw other published views of that original baby with the arms gone would know that the new picture had to be a fake. The original baby did not even survive until August 22. The new picture allegedly taken by that day for release by the Israelis was not even made in Lebanon. The photo shows an Israeli baby held up by an Israeli nurse photographed in a hospital in Tel Aviv. The tragedy of that tiny Lebanese baby was multiplied a thousand times over by the Beirut massacre. As always, the Begin government is waving its blood-spattered hands in gestures of total innocence. Last month I described the Israeli doctrine of state terrorism in which suffering and death are increased as much as possible as a tool of power. And in the Beirut massacre this month we are once again seeing that doctrine of state terrorism at work. In Damascus, Syria, PLO leader Yasser Arafat went straight to the heart of the matter in an interview with the French newspaper Le Monde. He said, and I quote, Begin and Sharon are not Jews. The crimes they commit do not conform to Jewish morality or tradition." Unquote. My friends, why is it that it takes a member of a different faith, a Muslim, to remind us Christians of something our Lord Jesus Christ said? Our Lord warned us against being taken in by those who are of the synagogue of Satan and the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews but are not. In AUDIO LETTER 50 nearly three years ago, I detailed the origins of the counterfeit Jews, the Khazar Jews. It is they who rule the nation that calls itself Israel under the banner of political Zionism. And it is they who have been expelled by Russia's new rulers and are creating a new Bolshevik revolution right here in America. The counterfeit Jews are a mortal danger to all real Jews as well as to everyone else on earth. We have been warned, but we do not heed those warnings. And so our world continues to reel from one crisis to another, each one worse than the one before. In Topic No. 1 I explained why Friday, September 10 was a turning point in the joint Bolshevik Zionist war plans. On that day Russia destroyed the Air Force Attack Confirmation Satellite which was parked over the Indian Ocean. Up until that day the Pentagon Bolsheviks and the Israeli Zionists had spent two weeks or so trying to lull Russia to sleep. Every effort was made to portray an impression of relative calm in the war-torn Lebanon hotspot. Simmering crises elsewhere around the world did not go away, but they also failed to escalate as originally planned. Most important of all was the premature departure of the United States Marines from Beirut on September 10. This was directly related to the Brezhnev Reagan hotline call which I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 78 last month. In their call, the entity Reagan was told that a beachhead in Lebanon by the United States troops will not be tolerated. The early departure of the Marines on September 10 was intended to send Moscow a false message to the effect, all right, we give up, there will be no war. The idea was to try to promote overconfidence on the part of the Kremlin leaders and make them relax. If the ploy had worked, it would have restored some semblance of the surprise element in the intended nuclear strike. But this attempt at deception by the Bolshevik Zionist Coalition did not work. As it turned out, Russia destroyed the American attack confirmation satellite on the very day of the Marine pullout, September 10. So from that day onward the tactics changed again. The false impression of calm gave way to a fast crescendo of new violence and war tensions. The new crisis buildup had two purposes. One was to provide a last-minute crisis atmosphere of sorts to help explain away the sudden nuclear war which was still planned for September 17. But by that point so many things had gone wrong with the Project Z war plan that its execution was no longer certain. And so the other purpose of the new crisis buildup was to get the older, longer-range war plans in motion once again. In my report last month I mentioned that the Israeli troops had already moved north to the outskirts of Tripoli. 
Up to now, Tripoli has been spared much of the violence that has torn southern Lebanon. But on Saturday, September 11, Israeli Mossad agents set off a car bomb made with over 150 pounds of TNT in downtown Tripoli. The alliances between Christians and Muslims that have given Tripoli a semblance of peace up to now are under attack. Two days later, Monday, September 13, the focus shifted to the north. A huge NATO amphibious exercise called Operation Northern Wedding 82 got underway that day off the Danish coast. It involved over 160 naval vessels, 250 combat aircraft, and some 25,000 troops from nine countries. Radio Moscow denounced the exercise as being intensely belligerent, quote, unquote, which it was. The so-called exercise was designed to seal up the Baltic and with it much of the Soviet Navy, and by strange coincidence, Operation Northern Wedding 82 was scheduled to last until Friday, September 17. The following day, Tuesday, September 14, the focus shifted back to Lebanon. In AUDIO LETTER No. 78 last month, I reported that the Lebanese President-elect, Monsieur Jamel, was an Israeli puppet. I also reported that the Israeli plan was to eliminate him, just as they did Sadat last year when it suited their purposes. On September 14, the plan was carried out. As usual, the Israeli government pointed fingers at everyone else for what their own Mossad agents had done. Elsewhere there was shock over what was designed to look like a surprise. By the way, even now the charade goes on. Just two evenings ago on September 28, our Bolshevik-dominated President kept it up in his news conference. Trying to defend recent American policy toward Lebanon, he said, who could have foreseen the assassination of the President-elect of Lebanon?" Unquote. Anyhow, on September 14 there were only three days to go until Z-Day, September 17. The pace started speeding up fast. Within hours after the Jamel assassination, the pre-positioned Israeli army began an invasion of West Beirut. The Begin government gave the camouflage excuse that it was to prevent a bloodbath. And as always, they said at first this was only a limited and temporary move. But by September 16, Israel had changed its tune. It was announced that the Israelis intended to occupy the western half of Beirut indefinitely. The Bolshevik allies of the Zionists here in Washington reacted as agreed for public consumption. They complained about the Israeli actions but did nothing about them. On Friday, September 17, the Israelis completed their military conquest of West Beirut. By that time, the Israeli High Command was ordering actions that bordered on insane frenzy. A United States Marine standing guard on top of the United States Embassy building was narrowly missed by an Israeli sniper, and the Soviet Embassy compound was attacked and invaded by Israeli tanks and troops. Under international law, that was equivalent to invading Russia itself. During that final week, the Israelis were doing everything possible to produce a sharp reaction from Russia to help explain away the impending eruption of nuclear war, but the Russians refused to take the bait. They did not react sharply to the Beirut invasion because the PLO was now gone, and with it the prospect of all-out carnage. As for the invasion of their own embassy, the Russians essentially turned the other cheek. Instead of a major international incident, the Israeli smashing of Russia's embassy compound turned into a virtual non-event. When the Project Z nuclear attack plan was finally scrubbed on that Friday of September 17, all the efforts to goad Russia shifted gears. On that very day, the Beirut massacre of Palestinian civilians was already in progress. By late the following Saturday evening, the world learned that a new Guyana-type massacre had taken place. And my friends, the purpose of this massacre was much the same as that which took place in Guyana four years ago. In AUDIO LETTER No. 40 for November 1978, I gave the details about what happened in Guyana. It was mass murder, not mass suicide. It was perpetrated in order to open the door to Guyana for a joint commando force of Americans and Israelis. Under cover of the Jonestown cleanup operation, a commando raid was mounted to wipe out a nearby Russian missile base. Likewise, 
The Beirut massacre this month was perpetrated in order to open the door to Lebanon for troops which were otherwise forbidden to enter. Earlier I referred to the Russian ultimatum of August 12 that an American beachhead in Lebanon would not be tolerated. It was this Russian ultimatum that caused the hasty departure of the Marines on September 10, even though the Lebanese government begged them to stay. When the Pentagon Bolsheviks saw their hurry-up Project Z warplane going down the drain on September 10, they contacted their Zionist military and intelligence partners. The Israelis were given the green light to create an overwhelming pretext for return of the American Marines to Lebanon. By the weekend of September 17, the massacre was fully underway. Israeli forces stood guard around the Beirut, Sabra, and Shatila Palestinian refugee camps while Major Haddads and other Israeli-controlled militiamen committed mass murder. During the nighttime, Israeli flares lit up the sky over the camps to enable the slaughter to go on non-stop. After at least 36 hours, actually more than that, the Israelis decided enough people were dead. Haddads and other military forces were politely ushered out of the human slaughterhouse and transported out of the vicinity. On Monday afternoon, September 20, the entity President Reagan went on television briefly with a special announcement. He was ordering the Marines back into Lebanon for more dangerous duty and without any pre-assigned time limit. And this time the circumstances are such that they cannot be protested successfully in public by Moscow. If the Russians were to tell the exact truth about what happened, who would believe them? The notion that over a thousand innocent men, women, and children were slaughtered just to bring the Marines back sounds preposterous. And my friends, that is precisely why it worked. As I say these words, some 1,200 Marines have just re-entered Beirut, 50 percent more than before. Another 1,200 are on the way, though this has not yet been publicized. They can be held in reserve or brought in at will. Another of the plans I made public in AUDIO LETTER No. 78 last month is now underway. That plan calls for a number of our Marines to be killed in Lebanon. It will be done by the Israeli Mossad and then blamed on Arab extremists. If it works, it will help shove the world down a new road toward eventual nuclear war. The United States now has a solid beachhead in Lebanon as well as in the Sinai. Russia has won by way of its proxy, Syria. Now. Russia and the United States are eyeball to eyeball in the Middle East. Topic number three. There's an old saying to the effect, everyone talks about the weather, but no one does anything about it. That may have been true when Mark Twain first said it nearly a century ago, but not anymore. For several decades men have been experimenting with all kinds of ways to modify the weather. One of the earliest and best-known techniques is that of cloud seeding to generate needed rain. But the science of weather modification has long since gone far beyond that. It's typical of many advanced new technologies that they tend to be first used for military purposes and are kept secret as long as possible. That is even more true of weather modification than it is for most other advanced technologies. The reasons are not technical so much as they are legal in nature. To understand why, one need go no further than the old cloud seeding methods I mentioned a moment ago. Suppose a farmer hires a cloud seeder to bring needed rain to his crop at a critical time in their growing season. The cloud seeder waits until some promising clouds develop and then flies over them, dropping a fine mist of chemicals. The chemicals help condensation take place in the cloud. And if all goes well, the farmer gets his rain. Unfortunately, other farmers farther downwind may be equally desperate for the same rain. By the time the seeded cloud reaches them, perhaps it is rained out. Perhaps no other rain develops soon enough to save their crops. The result? They may try to seek damages against the farmer who did the cloud seeding, saying that his tampering ruined their chances of receiving rain. That is a small but very common example of the legal problems caused by weather modification. Today the knowledge exists to make massive alterations in the weather, either for better or worse. But the scale of potential legal problems has also expanded with this knowledge. Today the legal ramifications of weather control are international and potentially violent. 
The net result is that the few nations possessing these weather control capabilities keep it secret. Over four years ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 34, I described secret American weather control installations which were then in operation. These were nuclear-powered electrical grids running along the shores of the continental United States. They were responsible for a number of strange weather phenomena prior to that and for some time afterward, but within a year after I reported on them, they were permanently disabled under mysterious circumstances. Several attempts have been made to restore their operation, but up to now those efforts have never succeeded. The American weather control grids were owned and operated by the Rockefeller Cartel and were intended primarily as a tool of monopoly. The giant Rockefeller agribusinesses of America are trying to wipe out the small, individually owned farms and take them over. Today they are succeeding at an alarming rate, primarily through financial means. But for a while several years ago they had the weather as an ally as well. The other main world power in weather control is the Soviet Union. Over the course of a number of past tapes, I have described Russia's advancing weather control techniques. Like the now defunct American weather grids, the Russian techniques make extensive use of atmospheric electrical charges to control weather, but there the similarities end. The Russian techniques are space-based and use two legs of Russia's space triad or strategic weapon. The orbiting Cosmos interceptors are not involved since they are basically nothing more than military patrol craft, but the monster beam weapons at Russia's five-year-old moon bases are used to create storms at sea, and the levitating Cosmospheres use their charged particle beams to guide storms to their targets. It has now been two and a half years since I first detailed the new Russian storm control techniques in AUDIO LETTER No. 54. The following summer I gave a warning that these techniques were about to be used to create hurricanes like nothing ever seen before. Shortly afterward Hurricane Allen terrorized America's Gulf Coast. It was one of the biggest, most powerful storms ever to threaten the area. It threaded its way through the Caribbean islands, staying over water, gaining strength. Then it began to sweep northeast along the coast in ways that mystified weathermen. Then very abruptly it just fell apart. The Russian controllers had made a mistake, as I detailed in AUDIO LETTER No. 57. It is now two years later. The hurricane season is again upon us, and the Russians now have a great deal more experience. Once again the Russians have narrowly beaten back a surprise nuclear attack attempt by the American Bolsheviks. And now the Russians are starting to strike back, beginning with the weather. During the hurricane season so far, our east and Gulf coasts have not been troubled by anything significant. Instead it is the western United States which is suffering from hurricane problems, an unprecedented situation. The situation is new, my friends, because it is man-made. As I say these words, the remains of Hurricane Olivia are gradually dying out over the northern Great Plains. It has brought incredible rains to the west coast, unheard of floods in Utah, and September snows in the Rockies. But if you think Olivia was bad, Hurricane Paul should be worse. Hurricane Paul is following a northeasterly course from the Pacific that took it past the southern tip of Baja, California two days ago. It is being programmed to sweep across America's Great Plains breadbasket from around southwest Texas northeastward. If the Russian weather controllers achieve a total success, the eye of the decaying storm will follow a track across Oklahoma, Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio and onward toward New York City and New England. Hurricane Paul will not remain a hurricane for long over land, of course, but wind is not what the Russians want from this storm. It is rain, horrendous amounts of rain. It is harvest time across vast areas of the Great Plains, the worst possible time for rainstorms. Within a matter of days the giant rainstorm remains of Hurricane Paul may effectively mow down much of America's promised bumper harvest of grain, 
and this is only the beginning of what the Russians are preparing to do in retaliation for America's unceasing war intrigues. The Russians intend to whittle away our military preparedness while making it harder and harder for the Bolsheviks here to stay in power. By the time the Reagan one-year extension of grain sales to Russia runs out, we ourselves may well run short of grain. Very soon the 1982 hurricane season will be behind us, but already the Russians are preparing to give America a very long, hard winter. Even as I speak, the Siberia Express weather war is already returning. This year of 1982 began as the coldest winter of the century across much of the United States. There were freezes in Florida, ice storms in Georgia, hurricane force wind storms along the Rockies, blizzards in the Northeast, and, my friends, it is all coming back again. In AUDIO LETTER No. 71 last January, I described a new Russian weather control technique that was responsible for these strange and extreme storms. Weathermen refer to it as the Siberia Express and with good reason. The air that refrigerated much of North America last winter was coming straight from Siberia, transplanted here by Russian weather modification. Last winter the Russian Siberia Express technique was applied only for a few weeks, but this time the cool-down is already underway. It began during August, and across much of North America east of the Rockies there were record low temperatures last month. In the dog days of summer, cooler temperatures cause no concern because they just make the hot weather milder. But if the Siberia Express weather control continues, North America will cool down farther and faster than normal. What that means, my friends, is a very hard winter. As usual, governmental spokesmen here are not telling you the truth. There are vague rumors floating around that we are in for a hard winter, but the explanations are not true. Only two years ago the United States suffered a summer-long killer heat wave and drought, and the experts blamed sunspots. Now we've got the opposite problems, drenching rains and abnormally cool weather, and they try to blame the same sunspots. The fact is, my friend, that the Russians are not just talking about the weather, they are doing something about it. And because of the unceasing war plans of our own leaders, what the Russians are doing to our weather will be very hard on you and me. Now it's time for my last-minute summary. In this AUDIO LETTER I have reported on the world's near brush with nuclear war this month. As of this moment, the danger of immediate nuclear war is now much reduced and still declining. Instead, longer-range intrigues are now resuming on the part of the Bolshevik Zionist Joint Military Junta. In response to these and the postponed Project Z hurry-up war plan, Russia too is now on the offensive, beginning with the weather. In the few moments left in this AUDIO LETTER I should remark on late word I have received about two items. One item is that at least one United States Marine has already been killed today in Lebanon. This is not the planned incident which I discussed in Topic No. 2, but it is a harbinger of things to come. The other item is a political alert. Last month I mentioned that the Bolsheviks here were worried that they had not succeeded in completely rooting out Haig's coup d'etat machine. I have just received word that an effort is now underway to set off major changes in the Reagan administration. Among the developments which may well take place shortly are the resignations of at least two Reagan Cabinet Secretaries. A scandal is also brewing within the Department of Defense, which is the center of Bolshevik governmental power here, and the White House itself may also be swept up in the turmoil. My friends, the days ahead will not be easy. A hard winter, a collapsing economy, and more crises lie ahead. But we should all be thankful for life itself. The enemies of our Lord Jesus Christ were stopped hours short are plunging us into nuclear war. Instead, he has given us one more chance. And, my friends, we must not waste it. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beaver. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.